pay, pay, pay. Whatever you get, you pay for, one way or another. The cheapest plan is to pay cash. There is a sort of satisfaction in giving money down for anything. Then you feel the matter is settled. No mortgage on your future happiness, heavy, heavy, hangs over your head. Think over all the things you ever got for nothing. You've paid for them every one. Paid perhaps in lowered self-respect, restricted liberty, an embarrassing sense of obligation. Something that has cost you more than if you had handed over the price at once. Stolen waters are sweet. The trouble is, nobody ever got away with them. Every ounce of sweetness made a pound of nausea. Self-indulgence tastes good, but remember the price, self-loathing. Pride is a comfortable sensation, but its price is a fall, which is not comfortable. When you do what you know is shady, in order to gain money or other advantage, you get your desire maybe, but it is prostitutes pay. You've sold yourself, and that is always a fool's bargain. Nature keeps books pitilessly. Your credit with her is good, but she collects. There is no land you can flee to and escape her bailiffs. You can cheat nature, abuse her, lie to her, overreach her. She is very complacent. You may do your will with her, but she never forgets. She sees to it that you pay her every cent you owe with interest. Every day, her bloodhounds track down the men and women who owe her. The newspapers are full of their shrieks of pain, their gestures of horror. Every generation, a new crop of fools comes on. They think they can beat the orderly universe. They conceive themselves to be more clever than the eternal laws. They snatch goods from nature's store and run. They enjoy the booty, laugh, and cackle at their skill. And one by one, they all come back to nature's counter and pay. Pay in tears, in agony, in despair. Pay as fools before them have paid. There is a perpetual, persistent ignorance, as eternal as wisdom. So enjoy yourself, youth. Eat, drink, and be merry. And let your soul delight itself in fatness and wine. Pluck the bloom of beauty and gather the fruits of laughter. But count the cost. Beware of the insidious credit system, and pay cash. At least then you'll know what it costs. Art and Democracy When you say art, most people think of museums, picture galleries, and old masters. It is quite the thing for gentlemen burdened with wealth to collect expensive and curious bric-a-brac and, upon the occasion of their death, to leave it to the city, to be known as the Smith-Jones Collection. What good is it? Who goes to museums? A very small portion of the people. The effect of the art gallery upon the community is something, but the whole idea is a very poor grasping at the real function of art in democracy. If benevolently inclined folk want to increase the ministry of the beautiful, let them improve the appearance of the houses of the citizens, the furniture in them, and the grounds around them. Particularly, let them make beautiful the habitations of the poor. A hundred thousand dollar picture from Europe is not in any way so valuable artistically as ten thousand dollars worth of trees would be or $20,000 spent on adorning the waterfront, or $50,000 invested in changing slum tenements into comely and home-like dwellings. Art for the exclusive set only, whether that set is millionaires or alleged highbrows, is as bad as anything else that is exclusive. Unless art can get to the common people, it is a superfluity. In Minnesota, the director of the State Art Commission, Morris Irwin Flagg, 
has been doing some sensible and real art promotion. He supplies farmers and dwellers in small villages gratis with models for attractive homes and landscape designs. The purpose is to beautify the dwelling places of the people and develop at the same time ambition for and a love of the beautiful in the minds of men with small incomes. This is the sort of artwork that is sincere and effectual. It gets somewhere. It helps. It is not a conceded effort to appeal to the superior classes. When we do away with the ugly shoebox farmhouse, with its abominable barn, and substitute something picturesque in their place. When we transform the village from a collection of huge dry goods packing cases set in rows, dull and dreary and stupid in appearance, into a lovely garden, trees and flowers, with houses of charming and individual attractiveness. When we get some sort of artistic unity in our city building, then we shall be entitled to be called lovers of beauty. Other states are following. California, Kentucky, Texas, and Indiana are formulating programs similar to that of Minnesota. Germany, Italy, France, and Canada have published the Minnesota plans. Says Mr. Flagg, this better housing program is supplementary to the other work of the commission. It circulates exhibits of industrial art, sculpture, home furnishings, home industries, and school art. It organizes home industries and handicraft classes, and puts into the field specialists to teach such work. And it has been successful in finding a market for its product. Futurists If writes Sir Francis Young Husband. We stand a two-foot rule on end, and take it to represent the period which has elapsed since man first appeared. It will be only the top inch that will represent the distance of time since the dawn of civilization, and only the last eighth of an inch that will denote the period of European civilization. As far as scientists are able to judge, the Earth is still in its infancy. In all probability, the human race is to continue for a million years or so. Before us, therefore, stretches out a vast future, inconceivably more influential than the past. There are two classes of minds. One is dominated by the past, and the other by the future. Wherever you find two or more men gathered together, you may witness the clash of these two types. There are conservatives and progressives, liberals and standpatters, orthodox and heretics, the adventurous and the safe. All of which amounts to saying that there are souls gripped by what is to be, and souls gripped by what has been. Both tendencies need the moderation of common sense. A certain conservatism is needed, because whatever good there is in the future, must grow out of the past. Civilization is a growing unit. And a certain progressiveness is needed, because without it the past would paralyze us with its dead head. Too much conservatism means stagnation. Too much progressiveness means anarchy. But it is the future feeling that most needs to be developed. The past is but too strongly entrenched already, in the consciousness of the world. It is from those million years to come that we should draw our inspiration. Law is now, and always has been, but the accumulated wisdom of the past. It ought to grasp the future. There should be more legislation for what will be than from what has been. Education is past-ridden. It should turn more toward taking as its norm the man yet to be than the man as he has been, or is. Morals that aim to make us conform to present or bygone social standards are irritating, but a morality drawn from what society will be can impassion us, and so develop us. The cities of ancient times are imposing in their ruins, 
but I like best to wander the streets of those magnificent cities of the days to come. Those dream cities, where democracy expresses itself in beauty, and the majesty of work is beyond all that war and kingcraft ever devised. Even so with life itself. The greatest contribution of religion to human life is the gift of a sense of the future, of another life beyond this. Whether this be provable or no, the very presence of the notion of it in men's minds lends them a dignity and a power nothing else could induce. If, as old age comes on, we have amassed only a past, a pile of memories and failures, then life moves slowly on to tragedy. But if there looms in the consciousness a feeling of a possible future, the mind finds in it a veritable fountain of youth. I make no bones of saying that I am, or want to be, a futurist. Anger Poison All the poisons are not kept chained bottles on the drugstore shelves. All the cases of strange illness and wasting are not due to the subtle drops from India, nor mysterious powders sold by old witches. And all the shocking deaths are not the result of taking tablets of bichloride of mercury, thinking they are of aspirin. The commonest, deadliest, and most dreadful poisons are those we carry around with us. They are contained in our mind. There is no doubt about the injurious effects of certain emotions upon the body. They are as well authenticated as the operation of henbane or arsenic. The exudation of sweat glands, for instance, has been analysed, and certain strong feelings have been shown to produce certain definite injurious secretions. Anger is one state which produces diseased conditions, as headache, loss of appetite, deranged digestion, even syncope. In one instance, the anger of a mother had such an effect upon her suckling child that it died in paroxysms. Not only the occasional outburst of anger, but those states we might call chronic anger, such as impatience, petulance, irritability, bad temper, and the like, produce as clear forms of intoxication, poisoning, as alcohol. Many cases of chronic indigestion, nervousness, morbidity, and hypochondria are attributable to nothing but slow anger poison. If one can clean the harmful ferments out of his body by a dose of salts or by the use of bran and oil, he can also cleanse his system of far more toxic contents by forgiving his enemies every night before he goes to bed by daily purging his consciousness of all hates, resentments, and grudges. Anger is sometimes unavoidable, as when we witness or hear of some outrageous act of injustice or cruelty. But if we must have it, let it be quick and soon over. For when it remains in us, it is we who suffer, not our adversary. It unnerves our hand, blinds our vision, impairs our judgment, and when it leaps to vengeance, invariably overleaps, bringing to us regret and remorse in lieu of satisfaction. Remember, wrote Lord Chesterfield, there are but two procedures in the world to a gentleman and a man of parts, either extreme politeness or knocking down. And mighty good advice it is from the old worldly wise philosopher, for anger that is balked or impotent, if kept lurking in the mind, settles into a slow poison. It distorts the features and makes even a handsome face ugly, gives a vicious twist to the smile and a forbidding cast to the eye. It distorts our thoughts. We become unpleasant companions to ourselves, and from ourselves there is no escape. It upsets sleep disturbs the simple delights of eating and drinking, degrades our work, and spoils our play. I do not say, don't get angry, but don't stay angry. <laughs>